Hello and welcome back to The Hatch. I'm Rosie Murphy. And I'm Sammy Roth and this is the podcast where we talk about Lost. You know where we are. We're in Season 6, Episode 4, The Substitute. It is a John Locke flash sideways. A John Locke flash sideways slash a man in black episode, since technically it is still two different characters. We're going to get into that with Tucker Gates, who directed this episode. Without further ado, let's get started. We start each and every episode with our hot takes. Rosie, what do you got on The Substitute? What is your hot take? This is kind of silly, but Hurley in the, the Flash Sideways owns the most bizarre and fascinating, like, constellation of businesses. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it reminds me of when people talk about, like, all of the stuff that Berkshire Hathaway owns. Or That's literally what just came to my mind, kind of because I've been writing about them all day, but yes, go on. <laughs> yeah, like all these big conglomerates that, like, you know, oh, in Hurley's case, he owns a chain of fried chicken restaurants. He owns a company that manufactures cardboard boxes. He owns a temp agency for some reason. Like, I mean, why not? He seems like a happy guy and he seems like he's loving his life. But I'm curious to know who his advisors are and if they seem very chaotic. That's all. I can't imagine that Warren Buffett has anywhere near the happiness that Hugo Reyes has that we see this week. Can't imagine. (laughs) No, Allegedly. the one that came to mind for me when you said that is that in addition to the, the railroads and the energy businesses and the insurance, uh, Berkshire Hathaway owns Seas Candy. Huh. Did you know that? I Seize did not. Candy. Beloved there Southern California candy maker. Yeah, thank you for adding that for our, uh, our listeners who are not uh, Southern California <laughs> residents, current or former. Anyway, Sammy, what is what is your hot take about The Substitute? Um, well, mine, mine's related to that, relating to Hugo's uh, employee, Randy Nations. Um mm-hmm. At, at this point, I think my hot takes after last week are just going to turn into like asshole of the week type of uh, type of deal. But <laughs> my God, Randy Nations, it's like he's such a jerk. He goes into that conversation clearly knowing that he's going to fire Locke and obviously already knowing, you know, that he skipped the conference. But instead of just coming out with that and getting it done, he plays with the guy. Mm-hmm. Has, oh, you know, how was the conference? It looks like you got a nice tan. You know, what what did you take out of it? It's like. He's just like maximum, you know, like fucking around with the guy's head. Such a such a such an asshole. It's terrible. Yeah, that that's all. I guess I guess Randy Nations being an asshole is not that hot of a take at this point in Lost, but it's uh, it's it's what I was what I was feeling. You told me you might have a second hot take, didn't you? I don't know if I would call it a hot take. It was just something that struck me as kind of funny, and this will this will take us into our discussion of Sawyer, who I think is the most interesting character in this episode. That's full of interesting characters. Um, Before you share the hot take, can I just say something about that? Yeah. The first note that I wrote to myself about this week, just like watching the the previously and thinking about what was going to happen, was that, like last week, this could have pretty easily been a Sawyer episode. Because <sighs> Sawyer is... So much is happening for Sawyer here, and it's all rich, and I'm so excited to talk about it, but... When the man in black comes upon Sawyer in his Dharma cabin, loudly playing his records, he is allegedly quite drunk. Mm hmm. Right? It, it seems like it, yes. Within a couple of hours at most, he is climbing down this like rope ladder on the edge of these cliffs. <laughs> <laughs> like, either he. You know, the man in black worked to some, you know, worked the forces in such a way that Sawyer got sober real quick. Or he doesn't come off as drunk. Yeah, I mean, I, I think the the easy explanation here is that the island cures hangovers. Perhaps, perhaps. <laughs> and very quickly, you know, normalizes any substance you've taken or something. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I I think somebody out there could make a pretty good case for that, actually, when you look at the islands, you know, he, people healing faster and shit. But that's that's a funny observation. I had not thought of that. Yeah, that's all. Josh Holloway is so, so good in all of those. I mean, him and Terry O'Quinn both, but like, my my God, it's just magnetic watching them with some of those back and forth and the dialogue is so good. Like every scene just is crackling. Oh, it's so good. And it's I mean, Sawyer, what what I love about this episode and Sawyer in it is that he's suspicious and he's skeptical until he's not. Mm. And you can see him get there. You can see the depth of the skepticism, you know, when he's 
he realizes right away that this isn't John Locke. He gives that fantastic observation about... Who are you? She sure as hell ain't John Locke. What makes you say that? Because Locke was scared. Even when he was pretending he wasn't. But you... You ain't scared. He gives the of a mice and men spiel. And then finally, at the very, very end, when the man in black is like done bullshitting him and just says, I want to leave this island. I know you want to leave too. Sawyer says, I'm all in. And not all in, but I'm in. He, said, he says, hell yes, as I recall. Yeah, I just think it's great. I think it's Sawyer at his best. Uh, you know, not in terms of his altruism, but in terms of his, the skills that he sort of brings to the party here. Um, sharp as ever. That, that's such a great ob- especially coming out of the, you know, the hangover that he should be having. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, I'm, I'm with you. What, one other moment, and I, and I think you hit on the big ones, one little one that I hadn't really noticed or thought about before that I loved in the scene, you know, after he makes the Of Mice and Men spiel, mm-hmm. where, you know, Locke, uh, Locke, you know, Man in Black gives the very convincing speech as well about, you know, oh, I, I, I've just been, I've been, who, who am I? I'm someone who's been trapped for so mm-hmm. long that they've mm-hmm. forgotten what it feels like to be free. I'm a man like you, etc. At the end of that, when Locke, Man in Black, turns around and walks away and Sawyer lowers his gun, there's this, like, he also lowers his head a little bit, and there's just this look of frustration that he mm. has. And I, I, I read it thinking, I was like, I read it like, okay, I, I think he's disappointed in himself for, like, not pulling the trigger and not going through with it and for actually, like being allured by what this guy is selling him. Mm. Like, and I think that just lines up real nicely with what you're saying, that this was a process of him, you know, he's skeptical until he isn't. Like, he's still clearly skeptical there, and he and he wants to just get this over with and destroy whatever this non-John Locke entity is. But he sort of can't help himself because he can feel himself growing convinced. Mm. And I don't know that it's just that. I think that that maybe, too, is... You know, Sawyer doesn't like to be outwitted. And I think that's Mm. what, you know, I think he thinks, you know, he he comes to this transaction, whatever it's going to be, ready for anything. And he thinks, like, I'm going to follow, you know, I'm going to try to figure out what the hell is going on here. And if I have to kill this person, I have to, you know, I'll handle myself. And the man in black just kind of outsmarts him and manipulates him, you know, and he's able to keep stringing him along. And Sawyer knows that he's doing that, but he still sort of can't help but go along with it because the man in black is so good at it. Yeah, and I think Sawyer thinks that he's not being strung along, right? He thinks, you know, well, fuck it, I don't have anything better to do. And then it's sort of like, okay, well, what what does this man have to show me? Until that moment where he lowers the gun. Yeah, and I think... The man, what the man in black is doing here is sort of poking and prodding and looking for the right thing to say to convince him. And then he finally finds it. And it's, I want to leave. Don't you want to leave? I, I kind of wonder if the man in black knew all along that he was building towards the, I want to leave. Don't you want to leave pitch? Like, I guess in theory, he could have made that pitch right at the beginning. But I, I kind of think it's more effective coming after the whole, like, Mm. you're stuck on this place because Jacob trapped you here, mm-hmm. just like he trapped me here. I, I kind of think that he was intentionally building towards that that specific pitch. Yeah. One other thing that I noticed in that last scene that I hadn't noticed before the last scene, the one in the cave, is where Locke says to him, you have three choices, right? And the three mm-hmm. choices are how he wants to respond to this predicament Jacob's put him in. Um, it brought back to mind Danielle Rousseau in Exodus, the season one finale. You only have three choices, run, hide, mm. or die. Uh, which I think is kind of a kind of a fun parallel, which, which are kind of actually now that I say that out loud, kind of the choices that Man in Black offers to Sawyer because the first one is, you know, wait and see what happens and maybe your name gets crossed off the list. Right, that's which kind is, of hide. That's no, that's dying. I think. Oh, because <laughs> that, that is how your name gets crossed off the list. That's true. Yeah, um, or you can or you can leave, which is run. Mm-hmm. Um, I guess hide doesn't really line up with the choice of take over leadership of the island, but the other two work. <laughs> Anyway, it's Good it's such back. a great plot. The whole story is great. Yeah, you know who else has a great scene is Richard. I love the scene where he sneaks out of the jungle to try to intervene here and get Sawyer to leave the man in black. Where 
Where is he? What the hell are you doing here? Where is he? Locke? Ran off in the jungle after some kid. We need to go now. Go where? To the temple. Let's go. Let's go. You know what? I've been to the temple. I think I'm sticking with Locke. That man is not John Locke. I know. And why are you with him? Because he's got answers. Says he knows why I'm on this island. Unless you want to tell me why I'm here, Richard. Don't be naive. He's not going to tell you anything. He's going to kill you. If he wanted to kill me, he could have done it a dozen times already. You don't understand what you're dealing with. He doesn't just want you dead. He wants everyone dead. Everyone you care about. All of them. And he won't stop. Richard is clearly terrified. Um probably because the episode starts with him in some kind of trap in a tree and, you know, the man in black cuts him down. And, um, but yeah, a good reminder that someone we know and trust is very, very afraid of this, of this person. Well, you know, one, one interesting thing comparing the Richard and Sawyer storylines, like the man in black also tries to manipulate Richard this episode and, and, and unlike with Sawyer. Yeah, exactly. And I mean, he's going to circle back around and try again and come very close in Abiturno, mm-hmm. but you know, attempt number one here, uh, Richard does not take, despite the fact that the bait that he dangles in front of him, I think is pretty good bait. Yeah. I mean, when he, I think it's pretty clear when he uses the term candidate, he knows that Richard is not going to know that word or mm-hmm. not going to know what that's referring to. So when Richard, you know, says, what, what candidates, what are you talking about? And, and Man in Black acts all surprised, like, what? Jacob never told you? Like, oh, all these years of service and he never brought you in on... I wouldn't have done that to you like that. It's. It, I'm surprised that that's not more effective. Richard's loyalty runs real deep. It worked on Ben. Yeah, it did. I mean, that's more or less the, totally the pitch right. that he made to Ben. Yeah. Hmm. Um, it also does raise the question, what the fuck was Jacob doing this whole time? Why didn't he tell Richard that stuff? <sighs> oh, we could, I mean... But I guess, mm, I was going to say because Richard wasn't a candidate, but Alana knows all this stuff, right? Alana and Dojin. Yeah. Dojin, who, based on his story about getting his son killed in a car crash after getting drunk, clearly has been on the island much less time than Richard has. Right. Because they didn't have, you know, no automobiles cars. in 1867 or right. whatever. So I don't know what the hell is going on here, but Jacob was... Not good to Richard. I mean, he did give him eternal life. I shouldn't say that, but yeah, but but was that good? Well, Richard asked. Sort, sort of. of. <laughs> Abiturno is going to be like a four-hour episode. We'll, we'll save that for when we get to it. But but I, I guess my point here is like I'm surprised the manipulation didn't work. But also like I think the man in black kind of made a good point. I mean, that's that's the thing, right? Is that the man in black is not necessarily wrong, right? Like. He just wants to leave, and I get it, you know? And Jacob wasn't all good, and the man in black wasn't all evil. Jacob clearly, like, I don't know if made some mistakes is the great word. Is I don't know if made <laughs> mistakes some... were made. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if it's, it's fair to call them mistakes, or if he was just misguided and just wrong, you know, um, in his sort of I don't know. I I wonder if Jacob came at this with a sense of like, you know, he he's the rule follower, right? These are the rules. I make them. I follow them. Everyone else follows them. And what makes the man in black so effective is his slipperiness, right? And his ability to apply slightly different rules to Ben as to Sawyer, as to Saeed, and to give people what they need so that they will will follow and Right. Which is not always good, but right. rules are also stupid, frequently, <laughs> frequently. And these ones. I mean, I think we should we should be cognizant of the fact that even though he keeps telling people all he wants is to leave, like, we'll see by the end of the season, like, he also has, right. you know, his, his, his anger has built up for so long and his vindictiveness, which may be understandable, but it, you know, it becomes very violent and destructive. Like, ultimately, he does attempt to kill everyone on the island by destroying the thing. Yes. Like he could have, he could have left without trying to destroy the island, which he did not. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's not hard to see why people follow him. Yeah. I mean, even again, Richard, once we get to Abiturno, he's going to go right on the verge of it. And until Hurley, you know, makes up the thing about, you know, what, what, uh, (laughs) you know, Richard's wife says Mm -hmm. that, you know, really what's coming from Jacob. I mean, Richard was going to, was going to switch sides at that point. Yeah. Well, and this is, I mean... I think often about when we talked to Damon Lindelof last season and he mentioned thinking about Jacob as a kind of Old Testament God. 
And like, that's a very Old Testament God way of being, right? Like, these Mm. are the rules. I set them for your benefit. Follow them or don't. But, you know, if you don't, there will be consequences. And if you do, you know, you'll be rewarded at some point in the future. Whereas most of our cultural conceptions of the devil or Satan or whatever are, he tells you what you want to hear. It works. It really works. Hmm. Um, this was such. A, I'm glad that this was such a good episode because I mean we we spent so much of the first two weeks this season like complaining about mm-hmm. the parts that were inconsistent or uneven and it's like this one was just firing on all cylinders. I agree. The funeral scene is an all time great scene. A and, classic. And there's, there's all sorts of stuff we can talk about there and 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 we'll you'll hear from us later in the episode with Tucker Gates chatting about that scene. But it's it's fantastic for all sorts of reasons. I mean, there's the Frank line of dialogue, obviously, Weirdest Damn Funeral. There's Ben's, you know, Ben's eulogy. Mm-hmm. I, I thought Michael Emerson just really, really killed it. Oh, yeah. I mean, this is, this is, it occurred to me that maybe this is like the first moment where it starts to feel like this guy, like, might actually change who he is, like, mm-hmm. for real. Like, he didn't need to say any of that stuff. Like, strategically, it was not a smart move for him to admit that he had murdered John Locke. Like, that right. is going to do no favors for him. Right. But he came out with that and said it because he felt bad and he wanted to apologize. He said Locke was a better man than he would ever be. He didn't have to say that stuff. I feel like this was the first real moment of like, wow, this and, – and, and Emerson plays it so well. Like this dude is really broken. Like he's kind of – when he walks away at the end, he's kind of hunched over. Mm. And he's wearing like – you know, he's wearing an undershirt with right. you know, a dirty unbuttoned he's shirt on top of, of it. sort of all sweaty because he's just been digging a grave. Yeah. Like here's a guy who we're so used to being like so – Quaffed and well put together and, you know, just so perfectly like, you know, having his shit together. And clearly mm-hmm. he's, it's just, it's all gone here. It's, I mean, that's what I, that's what stood out to me most about that scene. Mm. Like he is, he is completely broken and ready to be rebuilt, I think. That's interesting. Do you think he, do you think it's sort of a pure guilt? Like I did, I did something wrong and I want to atone for it. Or is it, there's an element of, oh shit, the man in black is back and he's corporeal and I'm part of that. I mean, John Locke's <laughs> body wouldn't be here. I don't think so because I don't, I mean, Ben still doesn't really know who the man in black is. Yeah, you might be right. He knows something is wrong here. Um but maybe, and maybe it's just enough to make him nervous. You know, he's seen the island do a lot of things. He's never seen it do this. And that's enough to rattle him <laughs> very deeply, True. you know? Like, that's fair. at this point, he's he's out of moves. And I don't know what, you know, I've completely lost my ability to control what's going on. So maybe that is sort of the start of Ben's, like, dark night of the soul, so to speak, mm. where he can he can really just start to feel like, man, I did some stuff that I regret. Um, yeah. I'm ready. I'm ready to go off Island if you'd like. Yeah. To go to the, the real lock. Actually, let me, let me, let me squeeze one more complaint in just very quickly before I do. It's not even a complaint. It's more of a, it's a, it's an ornery observation. I love the reveal at the end in the cave with the candidates and the numbers. Mm-hmm. Um, I think this is one of the show's best reveals, so I should just mm. lead with that. And just I, I thought it was a great explanation for candidates and what they were doing there. And I thought it was cool how it lined up with the numbers. Um, and we'll talk with Tucker Gates all about that scene. I, I just I have to point out because I can't help myself. The the thing with the numbers doesn't really actually make any sense. Like it was, you know, the numbers were the serial number on the hatch in the nineteen seventies, and then the button numbers. But Jacob has you know been working on this scratch board for who knows how long and the fact that he like scratched off people who had died like very recently in the last few years Mm -hmm. so it's like clearly back in the 70s even if some of them were already on there like there would have been a lot more candidates left so you know how does it get the timeline just doesn't quite work and also the whole thing where you know it could be either Quan and meanwhile Kate's not there and he later tells Kate I took you off when you became a mother like Clearly, the writers were trying to shoehorn the numbers in to work for the candidate thing. Right. And it doesn't make perfect sense. That's okay. I still love it. I still love it. I'm just pointing out that it it doesn't really add up if you think about it too hard. 
Yeah, I think you made this point a couple weeks ago, and I think it's a good one that like the numbers might have been fine if they just weren't something that was ever explained. It was a weird Dharma thing. Hurley played the lottery, you know, it could have sort of ended with Dharma, I think, and that would have been sufficient. But that's okay. I forgot that I said that, but I'm very glad that I did, because that's a great point. I forget what you were applying it to. <laughs> oh, oh, about the, whispers? the, uh, the whispers. The whispers. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. No, you're totally right. That works for the numbers as well. Yeah. They could have left well enough alone, and it would have been just fine. Anyway. Anyway. Lock. Flash yeah. sideways. Yeah, let's leave the island. Um, we can do what the man in black cannot. We can leave the island. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, yeah, a lot a lot going on with Locke here. This is the episode where we find out that he is not, in fact, this, like, serene, self-realized uh, person that he sort of presents as in the season premiere. I mean, he's clearly angry and frustrated and just sort of not super happy with his lot in life. Yeah, it's sad. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's funny because it's funny. It's It's like... He's with Helen. Mm-hmm. Like, they're very sweet together. Yeah. Like, they're they're adorable. Yeah, and, and at the end of the episode, he seems to, you know, it's a moment of, like, realizing what we have and being grateful for it. And, yeah. But it, but it's also not over because we know where this season is going. Mm-hmm. There, there's this, I mean, this is this is just what I was thinking about the whole time. Like, there's there's this tension that's so interesting between, like, accepting that there are things you can't change and, you know, letting go to use the Christian Shepherd language, which mm-hmm. I'm bringing up every episode because it's the key to the season in some ways, versus what Jack said at the beginning about nothing is irreversible. Mm-hmm. Like there's just this this real fine line, I feel like, between, you know, wanting to change things about yourself and your circumstance and feeling like, you know, as Helen says, miracles, you know, can happen versus you know, learning to love and be happy with what you've got and letting go of the things you cannot change, which is the thing that Helen says right after that miracles can happen. But also, you know, I I was only ever waiting for you. Mm-hmm. It's like that, that one thought encompasses both halves of it. And it's just, it, it's interesting because it's a very fine line between them. Yeah. Like, how do you know what are the things that you can't change and you ought to accept? And what are the things that are really like, you know, worth either hoping for a miracle or trying really hard to reverse them? I mean, I think, I think Rose gives us a good answer to that. Um, right when she says, I have cancer, terminal cancer. I'm sorry. When the doctors first told me, I had a hard time accepting it. But eventually I got past the denial part and I got back to living whatever life I've got left. And you can maybe take sort of the approach that says that sounds kind of fatalist and there are no miracles. And yet we know that when Rose got to the island, you know, she too was somebody who was healed mysteriously and ended up, she was ready to accept it, right? You know, and she Mm. and Bernard were able to say, heck with all you people and all of your fighting, we're going to go off and live quietly the rest of our days because we've, received a miracle and were able to be grateful for it. And I think that says a lot more about them than it does about their circumstances. But that's so interesting because she, yeah, this is, is, I'm so glad you brought that up because here in the flash sideways, she's saying, you know, you've got to accept the, you know, the reality of the cancer and that's what she's done for herself. And that was also her before they got to the island back in, you know, like real life. She, she was all accepting and ready to go. Bernard was the one who wanted to fight. Right. And and then, you know, once they got to the island and they healed, like, I guess for Bernard, it was different. But for her, it was kind of the same thing. It was accepting the miracle that they had gotten and not questioning it and, you know, making, you know, making the most of that circumstance, which was an easier circumstance to make the most of, but really interesting. Yeah. Whereas, yeah, when, when John was, you know, had regained the use of his legs, like, it sent him on this quest, right? I mean, it's this sense of I'm connected to this place and this is special and this is important. And Rose, Rose's position is maybe a lot more humble of just like, oh, I, you know, I have been given my lot in the, in the flash sideways. It's, I've been given this, it sucks, but I've learned to, you know, enjoy the life that I have rather than spend it 
trying to reverse what is irreversible or most likely irreversible. Um, you know, I mean, I think, I don't think there's one way that's right and one way that's wrong. It's just one way to live is to say, okay, I'm not going to fight this. I'm going to, you know, go with the flow and, um, learn to, to accept what I have and thrive in my unique circumstances. And the other approach is I don't like the lot that I've been given and I'm going to try to intervene to change it. Right. And and that was definitely who Locke was before he came to the island. Right. He, right. you know, don't tell me what I can't do. Don't tell me what I can't do. You know, trying to go on a walkabout, even right. though he's he's in a wheelchair. And then, yeah, like Rose, the island gives him that miracle. And unlike Rose, who says like, wow, great. Like, I'm just going to, you know, I'm just going to take this happily. Locke says, this must be a sign that I'm meant for something great. Yeah. And then mm-hmm. arguably he... uh you know, arguably he wasn't, and arguably that's what does him in at the end, his his unshakable belief that there must be some greater destiny for him beyond the miracle he's received of, hey, I can use my legs again, and that's what I always wanted. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know, that makes me think the show falls on the side of, you know, acceptance, but it, but it's not that simple. Right. It's kind of the man of science, man of faith thing in another form. <laughs> right? Science puts hard rules and limits and says, this is possible, this is not possible. And faith says, you know, miracles can happen and maybe there's something, you know, greater than just what seems possible. I agree with that. However, when has Jack Shepard ever said, these are the rules and some things are not fixable? That's so true. Jack is the one who wants to fix everything. And in fact is the one who told John Locke that nothing is irreversible. So Right. And in fact is the, but then he decides he's wrong about some stuff, but maybe he's not wrong about that. I don't know. I mean, he changes yeah. his mind about the island and about fate and destiny, but he's still that person who thinks he can fit. I mean, he tries so hard to let go of being that person. Like that's what Jack's story was about last season. That's what Jack's story is about, you know, at least the first part of this season. But at the end of the day, he is the one who has to fix everything. Mm. And then learn to let go in the afterlife, I guess. I know there's a lot of different threads. It's hard to pull them all apart. Yeah. I mean, I don't think it's a strict, you know, binary it's, but yeah, I think, I think the same, I think Rose and Locke and it's really illustrated very succinctly and nicely in this episode have similar circumstances in a lot of ways. And their approach to them is about as different as it's possible to be. And I think that, explains their different, um, you know, attitudes toward the world. I just, I find it so interesting. And I, oh, I know I, I keep coming back to the ending, but it's just, it's so interesting to me that Lost ends on the note of to remember and to let go. Hmm. It doesn't end on a note of how miraculous is it that, you know, like it, it's not to remember and to remember all of the ways that you, you know, you changed and improved and did good and, you know, fought the impossible. It's it's to remember and to, you know, whatever you couldn't do, whatever you couldn't change, to just let go and, and be okay with that. I just find it interesting that that's kind of the final message that the focus comes down to. Mm. It's too simplistic. I mean, it's it, that's not everything Lost is about, but that, that just is on my mind watching every, you know, every episode and every scene. Well, I think that is what makes... You know, we we talked a few weeks ago about these are people who have been through a ridiculous trial by fire on this island. Why in the afterlife do they choose to go back and live in the real world? And I think it's because, or maybe part of it is because, like, that is what most of life is and most of the challenges that we overcome are my boss is a dick (laughs) or, you know, um, illness or, um, complicated family scenarios. Like we Mm. don't crash land on islands and have to fight this mysterious population that doesn't want us there. It's like, (laughs) you know, we have to deal with normal ass life. And I think what I take away from what you just said is like, the the people the cast of lost like the these characters don't get more credit because they lived a particularly hard life 
you know, it's not like you overcame so mm. much. You climbed this huge mountain bigger than Rosie or Sammy will ever climb, right? Um, it's like you climbed your mountain and now your job is to remember and to let go. And that's like, you know, that can be as true for me as it is for you. That can be as true for Christian Shepherd as it is for Jack, you know? Interesting. Yeah. No, I, I'm really glad you said that, that, um, I like that a lot. I'm really, it's all coming together for me here in season six. <laughs> it is. I, I think by the end we'll be ready to write our, like, uh, you know, our PhD theses. Oh God. I, <laughs> <laughs> I, um, one scene that we haven't talked about, just that it's kind of the ending scene, almost, uh, the introduction of Dr. Linus. Yeah. At the teacher's lounge. That was so well done. I like that so much. Well, and it, it jarred me when we heard uh, Locke say, I'm the substitute, right? Because that's where we get the episode title. And I was like, oh, the substitute <laughs> is just like the substitute, the sub, you know, the substitute teacher I mean, in high school. Whereas, you know, you could also say, oh, well, it's, you know, the man in black isn't the substitute inside Locke's body. Like, it could apply in various ways, but... L- Lostpedia has a list of four different ways that it works into the episode. It's like, okay, Lostpedia, I'm, I'm good here. Of course it does. But I, I like the simplest explanation. One other one other thing I'll add, just to sort of counterbalance my asshole of the week hot take. Um, <laughs> sweetheart of the week, uh, Hugo. Yeah. In the scene with uh, Locke in the parking lot. He was just... He just couldn't have been better to the guy. Mm-hmm. Like, Locke was yelling at him for something that wasn't his fault... And he apologized for it, and he offered Locke his job back, and he agreed mm-hmm. about Randy being, he called him a douchebag. He set him up at the temp agency, yeah. and, he, and he says at the end, chin up, things are going to be okay. What a good dude. I love this version what of What a good Hugo. dude. I like benevolent billionaire Hugo Reyes. We don't know that he's a billionaire, but I like it. Yeah. I mean, at the very least, uh, many times over millionaire. Yes. At the very least. Should we go to Tucker? I think so. That was a, a rich and fulfilling conversation, but we have oh, wait, even wait. more rich and rich and fulfilling. And if you want to be a part of this conversation, we haven't we haven't talked about calling in with a hot take. Call, call our call. number nine five four six Dharma, and uh, leave us a hot take, sixty seconds or less. But in the meantime, let's hear from Tucker Gates. We are here via Zoom with Tucker Gates, who directed a number of episodes of Lost, uh, including three in the final season. The Substitute, Ab Eterno, and Across the Sea. Uh, we're excited to hear from Tucker about his work on those episodes. Uh, Tucker, thanks very much for being with us on The Hatch. Happy to be here. So, you know, let's let's start at the beginning before we even get to that. You you know, you have a long history on Lost. You, you did a bunch of episodes in the first season, um, and then you came back for one or two in the middle and then came back at the end. J- just kind of curious, how, how did you first get involved with the show? Who Who brought you on to Lost? How did that happen? Uh, I think Carlton and uh, Damon both, or Damon, I don't think Carlton was, when I first came on, I don't think Carlton was involved, but uh, Damon was there and I had worked with Damon previously. Um, I think I may have directed the first television script he ever wrote, but um, so I knew Damon a little bit. Um, I had done some work with ABC a lot, a little bit with Disney and, and uh, I think that's how I got on. I don't, I don't know beyond that, how I started with them, but then Carlton came on and I had worked with Carlton as well um, for a while and and then continued to work with him afterwards and Damon as well. And um, so that's how I got started. Um, and then the first season was super fun. I just loved it. I, I just loved working in Hawaii. I loved the cruise. I just loved working out on the beach all the time. We did a lot of work, especially in those early seasons up on the North shore. And for me, you know, growing up in Southern California, Hawaii was always such a great destination and, I like those jobs where you're kind of out in the elements. And uh, this was certainly one of those, you know, just working on the beach all day, coming home, your legs cramping at night because you've been on the beach all day and, 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 you know, running to beat the sun before it goes down and then be done with your day. And, and, you know, it just, it was really fun. And I felt like the Island, especially in those early episodes was a real character. And I really tried to shoot it in that way so that, you know, we had this big living character, this thing that was that 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 they were all stuck on, um, and and it was really fun. It was a great cast because you know every episode was its specific cast members episode. You know, it it reminded me a little bit of X Files when I'd worked on X Files, where 
you know, each episode you kind of treat it as its own little film. And that's what we tried to do as much as possible. And, uh, and I liked working with the Islanders. I really do. As long as we're talking about this, just a, a little bit to, to remind people listening, the, the three episodes you did in the first season, you did Confidence Man, which was a Sawyer episode uh, in translation, mm-hmm. which was Sun and Jin, and then also Born yeah. to Run uh, with Kate. Um, just curious, is, is there anything in particular that, that stands out in your mind? Um, I mean, you, you mentioned making the island a character, but just anything anything in particular that stands out from those those episodes of working with those folks early on? I mean, I, the, the second one, the 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 Korean episode, um, I absolutely loved. I got really into Korean film. I watched a ton of Korean film. We shot a lot of scenes in Korean. I had no idea what people were saying, but you know, I'd done that before. I directed some scenes in Chinese, you know, that were China, you know, in Chinese for X Files, and I'd done and and in Spanish, which I speak. But it's it it's really interesting as a director sure you know what the words are that they're saying and so you really concentrate on the physicality of the actors and the and the emotions and 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 the rhythms of the scene and and I think that that's what's in some ways although the writers won't think this more important than than even the words you know and and uh uh it, it was really fun and they were so excited and it was the you know we brought in all these other Korean actors and and we just had such a fun time. And when we finished, we went karaoke all night, the, you know, to <laughs> celebrate. It was really fun. And they're really good karaokers at karaoke. And I can't sing a lick. I have just the worst voice in the world. They would leave the room when I was singing. <laughs> that, that's, that's real fun. And, and that was the episode also. Like, I'm sure you had fun. But my main recollection of that episode is that's the one where, uh, where Michael beats, uh, beats Jin half to death. Um, you, get, you had some intense stuff that you were working with there. We did, and I had a I had a really beautiful scene with the engine that we shot at sunset, where she walks out to the water, and it was one of those things where you know we had like fifteen minutes, and I said, "Engine, run out to this point, and then I want you to just you know walk out to the surf and drop this you know this this blouse that you have on, and then just walk into the surf." And the light, you know, was perfect, and the wind was blowing, and we were shooting in slow motion, and. And the wind just picked up her blouse and she walked. And it was like one of those things where it, it's, it, you know, you'd think you had planned it for, you know, days or months, you know, to get it, but it really happened just in the moment. And those, I love that kind of stuff. Well, that's the island, right? I mean, that's Hawaii and that's the island in the show. It does and it's for you. filmmaking too. You know, it's like, you know, when you're filming in the, in the elements, you know, there's always surprises. Yeah. Yeah. You mentioned, that working on Lost was a lot like working on these miniature films because each one would focus on different characters and have different plot lines. A lot of people probably don't really know how a director's job works. So just kind of speaking broadly, like what was it like to direct an episode of Lost? How, when would you get the script? You know, what kind of conversations would you have with the actors beforehand? And then what would you do on set to sort of bring those stories to life? And how does that differ from what you might do on, on another show? Yeah, well, you know, it, it's interesting. It's like, um, you know, the scripts were not always there on time. <laughs> a lot of times we were prepping with an outline of the script, you know, and in some ways that's fun because you you get, can imagine the scene that you want to, not necessarily the one that's written. Um, but we do a lot of location scouting, you know, and then I'd find out whoever's, you know, whoever's episode it was. And, and we would meet, you know, a couple times before we'd start filming. And 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 talk about kind of what they wanted to get out of it you know because they all had you know real desires because everybody you know they'd all watch each other get episodes and you know and 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 it was always really fun that way um and so my job I think is um as a director especially in those kind of situations is to one like really understand the story that's trying to be told you know and I think that's the most important thing it's like if you can understand the character's journey you know for that particular episode and perhaps the you know the bigger arcing things although I tend to worry less about those and let the writers work about worry about those but if you can really understand story and talk to an actor and talk to the crew talk to a DP you know in terms of story and and what the story is you're trying to tell whether it's in the whole episode or if it's within the scene itself um, I think that's that's the best way to approach it. And, and, and then I think to really have a solid idea of what you want, you know, and how you want to tell that story. And, and 
you know, as I said, like if everyone is is a little bit of its own movie, you know, certainly Lost had a style, that's for sure. But um, there are also different ways to tell a story. And so we try to shoot it in a way that, that fits that story the, the best. And, and so I think that and just being well prepared so that when an actor walks on set, you know, they can look around and go, oh, you know, they really took some, this took some thought to set this up, that I'm walking into a set that's not, you know, it, it's not poorly, poorly prepped. I walk into a place, you know, where we're going to have to cheat it and make it, you know, make it happen, you know, just in the, in the thing. But it's like something that, you know, people took the time to really, you know, find a great location or find the right house or find the right room or, you know, something so that it, it, it feels right and comfortable to them. Cause then they just can do their work. And, and to me, you know, I like to start by seeing what they bring and then, and, you know, adjust it to try and, and make what they're bringing, you know, meld with kind of how I feel the story needs to be told. Yeah. And I think it's just, it's just like some people, like some directors are very scared of actors. <laughs> you know, I just think it's, you know, and maybe I was when I was very young, you know, in directing, but I think it's the most fun part of the process because it's the one thing you can't really, you know, you, it, it's the one fluid thing and the whole that's super fluid in the process. You can't count on anything. And, and it's where, you know, the really surprising things happen, the things that I didn't think of going into it. So, yeah. Yeah. So you mentioned that you just watched The Substitute, uh -huh. which I think might be, I'd love to hear about how, you know, everything you just shared <laughs> applies to that episode. It's, it's a weird one because you have, you know, Terry O'Quinn playing these two different, very different characters, literally different people. Yeah. Um, yeah. What was that like? Well, I mean, Terry's so good and he's so strong, you know, in some ways you just, you know, it's as a director, I hate to say this, but it, you know, is that really diminishes my role, but it's like, you get out of the way a little bit, you know, <laughs> but, you know, cause you don't want to, you know, mess it up, but Terry comes in with really strong ideas. And, you know, there was the, er there was the earlier episode with him, you know, I think from season one, that was so terrific that Jack Bender directed. And, and I really took a lot from that in terms of the language of how to tell his backstory. Um, and, and, you know, then he's playing with Josh, who, you know, I love working with, and Josh is such a wild card, and Terry's so centered, you know, and so it was kind of a great juxtaposition between the two of them, um, you know, because they're completely different actors, you know, and Terry's, you know, really well, you know, super experienced, and, you know, got an incredible craft, and a really strong sense of what he actually wants to make happen in a scene, and, he, and, and in some ways, kind of very method. It. I'll tell you, like the first time my wife ever came to set, you know, she was driving with a friend in the van and they're driving through the North Shore and they're going to, we're going out to, you know, where the location was. And they saw Terry walking down this, this street to, to work and he was, you know, he didn't get a ride. He lived on the North Shore. And he was walking down the side of the road with this big, you know, Bowie knife that he always had. And he was throwing it up in the air and catching it and walking down. And he's this bald guy with a big knife. She didn't, she had no idea he was an actor on the show. She's like, God, I just saw this guy walking down the street with this huge <laughs> knife. You know, I was like, yeah, Amazing. that's Terry. But um, yeah, that's so funny. I mean, listen, I think Terry is, I worked with Terry on another show after that, um, Patriot, which I loved too. And he was terrific in that too. It's just always a pleasure to work with him. So you you talked about you know just as a director your job being to really understand the story that that you know is being told here and and how best to tell it and how to communicate it. What, you watched so you watched the substitute before we talked. What, what what do you think was the story that you were trying to tell about Locke there? How would how would you describe it? Because again, it's just it's it's such a it's such an interesting episode where you've got a you know this this sort of flash sideways about Locke and then on the island he's a different person. What what were you trying to do there? I mean, in director? some ways, yeah, like I, I think in the most basic sense, yeah. it's about a, you know, like we all trying to sort of get beyond the confines of our lives, you know, so just to, to try and stretch, to try and, I mean, it's interesting, it's like going back and watching that show, it, it was really interesting to see how optimistic in his backstory life he really was, you know, when he falls off the, you know, onto the lawn and the sprinklers go off and you're expecting that scene where he's just like, freaking out and just so pissed the fact that he can't walk it, it's so interesting to see that take where he comes up and he's really you know and they're so pleasant with each other and you don't have any of that frustration that you have but you can see burning inside of him I mean that's what's so great is he, he's coming at it sideways he's not going right down the middle with it you know that you know it's not till later that you find out sort of what his 
you know, what his real main aim is. And when you see Locke, you know, on the island, um, he'll do anything to get off the island. That's a really yeah. interesting comparison. I like that. Yeah. Yeah. I know a specific shot that we're both really curious about. That episode, very early on, there's a shot where we're like in the smoke monster's point of view. And oh, the yeah, camera's yeah. kind of zipping in and out of the jungle and you see these little trails and you hear that telltale tick ticking that signals to you monster. that, you know, oh, we're the smoke monster for a moment. What was the story behind that? Well, they wrote the smoke monster and I, like I'm, I, my biggest thing was like, I could just going to do like alien and not see it, you know, <laughs> like or see the, see it as minimally as possible. And, you know, so that's, I think, and I think, you know, Jack and all those, you know, all the directors on the show were just, you know, that was sort of the mode that we were sort of acting with the smoke monster with. I saw it a little bit more later in, in some episodes I did, but um, I think it's, you know, I mean, I don't know. We, we, I always think what you don't see is scarier than what you see. And so we we're trying to just shoot through the point of view, you know, and, and I think, yeah, I mean, I don't know what else to say about yeah. it. Well, you do it again. And I, I think this was the first time in the show that you have a, a point of view from the smoke monsters perspective, but you do it again in Abiturno later in the season That's where right. it approaches Nestor in, in the ship in and the sort ship. of takes pictures of him. It, it's a, it's a cool effect. Yeah, I love. That's where I think we really kind of nailed it. I I loved those scenes in the ship. Um, that was my that was one of my favorite times on the show was shooting those scenes with Nestor in the ship. Well, we'll it was a great to, set. Yeah. Well, let's let's get to that in a minute. Since we're on the island, talking about the smoke monster in those scenes. Um, the the other scenes on the island that really stood out this episode, you know, in the cave where they where they climb down the ladder on the you yeah, know yeah, yeah. bluffs and then. Um, a couple of questions about that. The, the climbing down the ladder stuff is is wild. I, I assume there were stunt doubles involved, but were you really filming out on a you know a little hanging rope ladder on a bluff somewhere for that? We totally were. Um, so we went out to China Cliffs, which are um, you know just uh, just outside Honolulu. Um, it's a great location. I loved this shoot. I loved working there, and we had these insanely amazing um, rock climbers who came in and did all the work on the cliffs and they did all the filming on because we sh I wanted to shoot I didn't want just a green screen you know cheesy thing I wanted to shoot as much of this practically as I could and so they they were out there for for two days rigging on that wall wow. and and built the ladders and we shot all the wide shots practically it was really fun and then they shot you know, I had these guys who do rock climbing movies go out and shoot a lot of the, you know, the sort of the profile work, you know, and, and some of the stunt work where they, you know, where, where um, Josh falls and things like that actually out on the rock. And then we had a smaller cliff that um, was part of the same, you know, uh, um, the same cliff group but it was just a smaller drop it was like a 30 foot drop or 20 foot drop and and we built you know pieces of the ladder on that and i shot the actors on that but, but i really i really loved shooting out there and doing that it was really fun and plus at lunch we jump off the cliffs into the water it, was really fun. <laughs> it, it looks super cool and um yeah the, the sea and then when they get into the caves and there's the names on the wall scratched and I, I, I assume that was on a set somewhere that was a set for sure that was a yeah. set it pretty pretty neat set though uh and it looks that was one of the better cave sets because there was a few cave sets that weren't so great on the show <laughs> <laughs> I, I agree. But that one worked out really well yeah i really liked that one a lot that was yeah. zach zach came in and did a great job with that cave. that's that yeah. zach uh, grobler is that a yes um, that's right that's yeah. very zach good. i had worked with um before that um and uh, I really like him a lot. He's a uh, South African. He'll, he can do anything. He likes to work out in the bush. This, I mean, it's a, it's a cool scene. Terry and Josh are both great when they're in that cave. In, yeah. you know, it's, it's this big reveal, like, oh, it's, it's the, you know, it's, here's what the numbers mean and here's why you're on the island. Was that, was that meaningful or significant to you as the director that it was kind of like this big plot moment or not, not so much? I think it it was in the sense that I knew that it was huge for the show. And so I didn't want to get anything wrong. <laughs> so it was big for me on that level, on a storytelling, you know, on a sort of directing level, maybe not as much in the sense that um, 
No, I, I mean, it really was. I knew it was, but I also, I was so caught up in, you know, making sure that the, you know, I gave the writers exactly what they needed out of it, you know? So, I mean, so that becomes my, you know, really modus operandi of that, you know, it's like making sure because this is such a big, you know, um, a big, you know, overarching reveal, you know, um, just like we've had, you know, we have later with, you know, Men in Black and all that, but it's just like, I just wanted to make sure I got those right, because I didn't understand all of them. <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> well the, that, that makes sense to me, but the, the thing you, the one thing directorially that I thought was really interesting that I was curious about is you, you cut as 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 they're showing each of the names on the walls of like of the remaining candidates. You do those quick cuts to the scenes from the the season five finale where Jacob you know reaches out and touches each of those individuals. Right, each one of them. Yeah. Was, was that was that right out of the script or was that was that your choice or how did that come? How did how did you do well, that? Well, those those clips were pulled out of the script. Yeah, it's all written into the it into is the script. I believe. Okay. I think I'd have to go back and check, but I think yes. Okay. Well, it's, it's a cool effect. I mean, whatever you ended up doing, I, I think the whole sequence works. It was, well. no, it's a great effect because it's, it, it's, it, it's one of those things where it's, it, you know, it, it puts pieces of the puzzle together. And I think that's always exciting for, for viewers, you know, it's like to see something actually come together and go, Oh, Oh yeah. Okay. Now yeah. I see. And, and I loved seeing everybody be in these different states of their lives when they got chosen. And then Josh, it's like not knowing that he had, been touched by him when he was a younger kid yeah. you know josh is great in that in that scene <laughs> yeah. yeah um the uh, a couple other things i wanted to ask about in this episode um you so going back to the the, the flash sideways story which uh you know turned out to be this, this sort of purgatory space um you know so you talked about Locke falling off the chair and landing on the lawn um another scene that really stood out to me was the the scene at the temp agency uh -huh. uh, where you know Rose El Scott Caldwell comes and talks to him. You, it, it, it's a very uncomfortable feeling scene, and you have these shots at the beginning where it felt like you were really like you know honed in. You know these kind of direct straight shots on on Locke right. and on the woman dealing with him. Just I, I was hoping you could just talk about that scene, what you were going for there, because it it's, it stood out to me and it felt really interesting. And I couldn't I couldn't quite put my finger on why it's an uncomfortable sequence. Well, I mean, I think the way that we shot it, you know, especially the, at the front end of the scene where he's being asked the questions by the interviewer and like what animal does he think he is and all that kind of stuff it is I wanted it to feel like he was being sort of locked into you know what people's preconceptions of him were and, and that's the whole point it's like to try and break out of that he doesn't want to be you know he wants to go on this outback what you know this walkabout you know he wants to do these things that most people would say you can't do he wants to you know be the manager of the construction site you know those things that you know, like, don't limit me, you know, is kind of the thing. And, and so we tried to sort of shoot it in that way for him too. And, and then I think when Rose comes in, I mean, she has such a beautiful way about her. I, I, I love her. And, and, uh, and, and it sort of sort of loosened the scene up a little bit. And I wanted that, you know, you know, that to be the feeling that we got, you know, and when she says, you know, listen, I have cancer. And, um, you know, I just, I, I, there's an empathetic kind of, feeling coming from her too that I really liked you know and and uh and that maybe a door was opening up for him I thought was really interesting did, did the writers tell you that these scenes that you were filming were part of the afterlife or did you have no idea like the rest of us I don't know I can't remember <laughs> probably they didn't probably they didn't tell I you. can't remember I you know I I you know it's so interesting it's like and I'm I get so caught up in just directing the scene itself, but then I'm not always, sometimes it's better for me not to know those things, you know, it's, mm -hmm. it's, an, it's an interesting thing because then I don't shade it one way or another, you know, and, and, and I think, um, I mean, I hate to, you know, sort of be so ignorant about it, but uh, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Is there, is there anything that stood out to you when you were rewatching that episode that, you feel really proud of or that you really? do different. I mean, I love the scene on the cliffs, but, but also really when I watch, you know, when I watch Locke and when I watch Terry, I mean, he just, he's so big on the screen. I really, it was really fun to see him again and be reminded of that because he's really got a power and some strength to him, you know, being able to capture that. And, you know, if he's going to do that, put the camera in the right place. So you capture it, you don't miss it. Yeah. 
Yeah. I think the only other scene in this episode that's of any great importance that we haven't talked about is the, the fabulous Jeff Fahey one-liner, weirdest damn funeral I've ever been to. Uh, you, you, got to <laughs> you got to film Locke's funeral sequence. I just wondered what that was like. <laughs> I did, which was kind of wild. Yeah, and Jeff and I go way back. We've done, we did this, a series together um, called The Marshall uh, uh, quite a long time ago. Um, and so Jeff is hilarious. And um, we, we had him on the, the podcast he, last year too. He, he's great. You did? He's great. Yeah. <laughs> Awesome. He was delightful. Was he? Yeah, he can tell a good story. It's awesome. Yeah. Um, he's the perfect guy to tell that line, you know. <laughs> and it was fun doing, like, I do like that. I mean, that's another one, I guess, one of those scenes you're right, where it's like, it's a big scene for the show. And it was fun to set up and and uh, and to see Terry down, <laughs> down in the grave. It's always funny to do those scenes. But Terry was just lying there? Yeah throwing dirt on him. That's trying hilarious. not to get it in his face. Yeah. Oh boy. You know, I love this interview. It was so much fun talking with Tucker and I'm excited to share the the additional parts of this. I got to tell him as a writer myself, I I disagree about the uh, the actors and the physicality being more important than the words. It all comes from the words. That's the foundation upon which it's built. <laughs> so just uh didn't didn't have the the heart to tell him that I disagreed with that, but for the record. Mm. That, you know, we all interpret art different ways. Um, You know, you're probably one of those people who learns best by taking lecture notes. Some people are visual learners, you know, takes all kinds (laughs) to make a world. Um, I don't think that's the same at all, but fair enough. (laughs) Fair enough. No, I should uh, I should credit the uh, (laughs) just for the record, as long as I'm saying this, the uh, the writers of this episode were Elizabeth Sarnoff and, and Melinda Sue Taylor did a did an excellent job, I think. We'll have more from Tucker in a uh, in a couple of weeks. He he directed uh, Ab Eterno and also Across the Sea. So we'll uh, we'll play the second half of that later in the year during Across the Sea. Next week we'll have a, a great one for you. Several time guest on the Hatch, Michael Emerson. Yeah, very excited to have Michael Michael back uh, talking all about season uh, season six. Um, we love to hear from you. Follow us on social media. We're on Twitter at the Hatch Podcast, Facebook.com slash the Hatch Podcast. Sammy said it earlier, we'll say it again. You can leave us a hot take at 9546 Dharma. It's a U.S. phone number, so just add the number one if you are out of the country. Ratings and reviews uh, are great as well. If you listen on Apple Podcasts or Spotify or iHeart or wherever you get the show, uh, drop us some stars and tell us what you think. Our theme music is by Andy G. Cohen, and our cover art is by Danny Roth. And we will be back next week. Namaste. Namaste.